Good morning, everyone. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over the admin details. Uh, the slides, the slides for today's presentation are available in PDF format in the handout section of your webinar control panel to the right of your screen. Questions, we encourage you to submit questions using the box marked questions near the bottom of your control panel. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll have a separate question and answer period at the end of all of the presentations and we'll respond to any questions received at that time. Live captioning, Access to live captioning is available during the program and there is an address on the screen for you to access live captioning. Webinar replay, a replay link and a transcript will be available early next week and will be posted to our website. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please try the toll-free number on the screen or the link to the GoToWebinar. So, um, with that, let's go ahead and go through. Um, thank you all for taking time to come to our webinar. And um, first up is the treasurer. Uh, Fiona Ma is the California's 34th state treasurer. She was elected on November 6, 2018, with more votes than any other candidate for treasurer in the state's history. She is the first woman of color and first woman certified public accountant elected to this position. The state treasurer's office was created in the California Constitution in 1849. It provides financing for schools, roads, housing, recycling and waste management, hospitals, public facilities, and other crucial infrastructure projects that better the lives of residents. California is the world's fifth largest economy, and Treasurer Ma is the state's primary banker. Her office processes, well, our office, processes more than two trillion in payments within a typical year. She provides transparency and oversight for the government's investment portfolio and accounts, as well as for the state's surplus funds. Treasurer Ma oversees an investment portfolio of more than $102 billion, approximately $20 billion of which are from local government funds. She serves as agent for sale on all state bonds and is trustee on over $100 billion of outstanding debt. So if you could please start the recording. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. I'd like to offer a warm and personal welcome to the more than 200 registrants who have signed up for this webinar. I had the opportunity to meet many of you last year at the LAFE conference that my office held in Sacramento. And while we could not hold the conference in person this year, as we had hoped, I'm happy to have this chance to speak with you this morning. As your state treasurer, my duties include the management and oversight of the state's pooled money investment account the PMIA. The PMIA is a cash pooling and liquidity management account in which all major state funds are physically concentrated into a single cash, cash position for investment purposes. It is a commonly used approach in large treasury operations in both government and corporations. A principal component of the PMIA is the local agency investment fund. I recognize that LATE is simply an alternative vehicle for your agency's funds. That has always been the purpose of LATE, to augment your own agency's investment strategies for larger jurisdictions and be a responsible and representative approach for smaller agencies where LATE represents a greater share of your investable funds. As a result, LATE exhibits some unique characteristics. The PMIA is unlike the resources of CalPERS, for example. The latter assets are what is sometimes called patient capital. That is, a portion of the assets will be dedicated or deliberately, sorry, deliberately invested in higher risk assets with a degree of patience that will allow for the passage of time required to attain the higher returns accompanied by exposure to greater risk undertaken to achieve greater returns. By contrast, the PMIA is not a long-term investor. The PMIA's bedrock objectives, which are also late, are to preserve capital, remain liquid, and to stay always prepared to make the cash being made available on a very short notice, often as little as 24 hours. 
Presently, the state maintains only the minimum required balances in its banks to compensate those banks for the services provided to the state as a whole. The remaining funds become part of the PMIA and are designated as investable funds by the Pool Money Investment Board, which I chair, and which includes the state controller and the governor's director of finance. There are a number of considerations my professional staff uses to make prudent investment decisions about these investable funds, including these five considerations. One, the investment of surplus cash that recognizes the future need for such cash may range from a few days to several months, but which is predominantly expected to occur within one year. Two, the investment of idle cash in which the date for disbursement is more predictable or controllable and where the disbursement is dependent on external events, such as the receipt of federal or local matching funds, scheduled programmatic, programmatic disbursements, and completion of engineering studies or environmental clearances, et cetera. Three, the investment of earmarked cash set aside for a particular purpose, for example, to fund debt service reserves. Four, the investment of temporary cash received from a recent development of a program such as the enactment of the recent wildfire fund program. This type of cash is typically irregularly irregular and the disbursement date is often predictable and of key importance to you. Number five, the investment of cash beneficially owned by others while in the custody of the state treasurer such as late. LAIF is a proven investment alternative that provides representative investment return, liquidity, which is virtually immediate, and the safety of principle that is guided by state law and a rigorous investment policy that is managed by my office and which is reviewed by the PMIB at least annually. I also note that the costs of LAIF are dramatically lower than any commercially offered mutual fund in the United States. These efficiencies benefit all Californians because of the broad participant because of the broad participation in LAIF by agencies like yours. Some changes to LAIF that I authorized over this past year include increasing the amount per account that you can keep on deposit and the addition of emergency accounts. Beginning in January of this year, we raised the per account deposit ceiling from 65 million to 75 million. In addition, with the welcome relief of the CARES Act funds in May, I approved a revision to our normal practices that would enable your agency to invest these funds in LACE in a discrete emergency subaccount. I am hopeful that these assisted you in a meaningful way for your COVID-related costs. While LACE is an investment challenge, it is far from the only investment challenge that we collectively face as treasurers. As part of my duties, I sit on numerous boards, commissions, and authorities, including the state's two major retirement systems. Earlier this year, CalPERS investment managers proposed a strategy aimed at improving the probabilities that PERS would achieve investment results consistent with an assumed 7% rate of return on its invested funds. In simple terms, the idea is to follow a strategy of what PERS calls better assets and more assets. The former element encourages the PERS investment staff to safely diversify risk by including earlier equity investments in smaller, more dynamic companies that are most likely to produce superior growth based on where those companies are in their own development. The second element permits selective use of leverage within the investment funds to compound results in those cases where leverage will enhance results. It is important to remember when you examine the results of PERS investments that comparisons can be dangerous. For example, recent changes in rating agency methodology requ require reporting of the market value of assets rather than the more meaningful actuarial value of assets. The latter value should be considered equally even though it embeds assumptions because investment funds will never be liquidated as, at a single point in time to meet cash flow demands of any retirement system designed to pay benefits over an extended period of time. So the headlines about the health of PERS needs 
to be understood in that context. Nevertheless, I know that many of you remain anxious about what the future holds for your agency's contributions to PERS to support your retirees. I can assure you that the dual responsibilities of protecting the income of our retirees and easing the negative impacts on your budgets and financial resources are always on my mind. Another area I'd like to highlight is my office's work continuing the ideal set by prior treasurers of greening the state's economy. When the World Bank debuted green bonds in 2008, then Treasurer Lockyer took notice. He valued the idea of green bonds issuing, issued by others, especially AAA rated issuers such as the World Bank. So he arranged a significant purchase of that offering. Presently, the PMIA portfolio that I manage holds $3.9 billion in debt securities issued by supranationals, including the World Bank, many of which are specifically designated as green. My most recent predecessor, John Chung, continued Treasurer Lockyer's work in green finance, but went even further. After several years of dialogue with the international investment community, he recommended that California consider the establishment of a green bond market development committee. I am pleased to say that I have implemented that recommendation and now serve as the committee's chair. The committee is domiciled at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. It consists of about two dozen finance experts, environmentalists, experienced lawyers, and government officials who share a common belief that the pivot to green finance is crucial to both renew our public infrastructure, but also to satisfy the needs of the rapidly growing number of institutional investors who are demanding greater transparency on the investment of bond proceeds from offerings they buy. The committee is presently deeply involved in outlining a responsible issuer program that would describe the key elements required by green investors to satisfy ESG requirements. The committee is doing critically important work in socializing the concept that much of our borrowing is already green, but needs to be presented as such to the investment community. Just as LAFE should be understood to be a collective and collaborative effort among us as treasurers, responding to the clear references of major investors for better identification of green financial investment needs needs to stay on our radar for the immediate future. Finally, I also remain active in urging our federal legislators to consider and adopt policies that would aid your agencies. A partial list includes new funding for the, small, the state small business credited initiative that would spur economic recovery of California's smaller businesses that have been hit especially hard by the pandemic. A congressional reauthorization of rules to permit advanced refunding of your outstanding debt. Continual advocacy for the preservation of the income tax exemption on interest you pay on your bonds. And consideration of a reauthorization of the Build America bond program but this time with specific protections against subsidy reductions because of parliamentary moves such as sequestration. I know that as long as we work together and encourage and challenge one another to better financial management, all of our constituents' well-being will be enhanced. Thanks for attending today. I hope you have a great virtual conference and hope to see you back here next year in person. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer Ma. Um, next up is Ian Lingen. Ian is going to be presenting an economic portion. And Ian is the managing director, managing director and head of U.S. Rate Strategy and BMO Capital Markets Fixed Income Strategy Team. Ian. Great. Thank you. And thanks for allowing me to present some of my ideas about how I see things playing out in the U.S. rates market over the course of the next several quarters and even as far as the next few years. So if we can switch to the first page of the presentation. 
what we've done here is I have broken down the outlook for interest rates by the key benchmarks in the nominal market over the course of the next four quarters. There are a few things that I would like to highlight early. The first is that the two-year sector, in consistent, or consistent with what the Fed has already told us, is in a very tight range, and it's a range that we expect to be retained for the foreseeable future. So in practical terms, that means that through 2021 and 2022, we would anticipate that the range for two-year yields is going to be somewhere between 5 and 20 basis points. There has been a reasonable amount of chatter that the Fed could roll out some new initiatives, uh, including a, a, an extension of WAM, or the weighted average maturity of the QE purchases that are currently in place. Uh, the Fed could also do something akin to what the Bank of Japan did, which was implement yield curve caps, or for example, say that the two-year sector yield can never reach more than 25 basis points, 20 basis points, et cetera. Uh, in that event, in such an event, we would put a, a, a lower bias for rates over the or for front end rates over the course of the, the next few years. But we're still a ways away from that. And the fact of the matter is, the Fed has made it very clear that they're willing to step up and do what is needed in terms of monetary policy. However, at this moment, the emphasis has been on fiscal policy and getting more delivered from Washington in terms of a second bailout, uh, fiscal 2.0, let's call it. So looking further out at the shape of the curve, the two-year sector and increasingly the five-year sector have been anchored very well to monetary policy, to monetary policy. And when we think about 2021, that range, call it in the more immediate uh, term, call it 10 to 20 basis points, will be extending further out the curve all the way to the five-year sector. I'd suggest that this is very consistent with uh, the, Fred, the Fed's transition to a new framework, which really was another way of the FOMC communicating that they have very little intention of normalizing monetary policy for a very long time. So what that implies is that the most interesting, the most exciting price action in the treasury market will occur further out the curve. Now, we were talking about the 10 and the 30-year sector, but in the context of financial markets in the middle of the pandemic, we are really seeing an increase in the correlation between price action in equities and the feedback loop into the treasury market. So the shape of the yield curve has become largely a directional trade and optimism being priced into equities has leaked through within a tight range to 10 and 30 year yields. So I have penciled in for the end of this year, 10 year yields drifting as high as 1% or 100 basis points but that will represent a, a meaningful buying opportunity. And I would characterize the next couple of years of trading in the treasury market as being defined by the range and the most exciting moments being when we, when we, we reestablish the caps and we reestablish the lows as the process goes through. So let's move on to the next slide. What's presented here are the Fed's outlook and the Fed's forecasts for the next three years. This is published alongside the FOMC decision. And the reason that I've included this is because I think it offers important context on a number of different levels. The first aspect that I would highlight is that the GDP estimate for 2020 in the early parts of the pandemic, which was uh, the June estimates, show the net contraction of real GDP in 2020 was estimated to be 6.5%. That is now, as of September, been improved 
to negative 3.7%. Now that's a very meaningful contraction, but nonetheless, less dramatic than was expected when we started the, uh, when, when we were in the midst of the pandemic. The other aspect of this uh, chart, of this um, table that I think is relevant is this transition that the Fed has made to an average year-over-year -year inflation target has been accompanied by a soft unemployment target. Now, we don't know exactly what number the Fed is ideally targeting for some version of full employment or Nehru, but what their projections give us a glimpse at is their willingness to let inflation run hot and the unemployment rate run much lower than it has in prior cycles. So I'd like to draw your attention to the, the column for 2023. In 2023, the Fed is, if all goes according to their plan, projecting that inflation will be at 2%, the unemployment rate will be at 4%, and they will still have rates at effectively zero. That's a pretty significant message, and it's a message that has many in the market, myself included, concerned that once we get through the transition back into some version of a new normal post-pandemic, we will have a lot of stimulus in the system, and that stimulus is going to risk a meaningful increase in inflation. Let's move on to the next chart. So I've made the argument that we are going to be trading a, a range for the next couple of years in the nominal treasury market, 10s and 30s in particular. What I have outlined on this chart is the history of 10-year rates and how they have tended to trade and trend. And the upper part of this chart, it is the blue line is simply 10-year rates. The red line above that is a 52-week look back for the high, and the dark blue line below that is a look back for the low. And then the green line and gray bars on the bottom part represent the size of the range. So what we learn, what we can see from this is unless the market is experiencing a massive repricing, for example, what we saw at the beginning of this year, historically, the 10-year yield has traded in a range of somewhere between 75 and 100 basis points. So as I contemplate what the next year or two will look like, I'm operating under the assumption that the center of that range is going to be in the, the 65 to 75 basis point range or zone, which is with what we've seen uh, for the last several months. And in such an environment, a backup in rates based on economic optimism, based on the passing of event risk, et cetera, does leave the possibility of a 1% or higher 10-year yield on the table. However, one of my primary concerns in such an eventuality would be that equity markets and risk assets do not respond well, because if we think about the period between 2000 and uh, 18 to, or in 2018 and 2019, whenever we had a significant backup in treasury yields, we'd start to see a corresponding wobble in the equity market. And if we jump to the next slide, the reason that I'm concerned about the equity market and the feedback loop to treasuries is just looking at uh, Fed funds futures, which is what this chart represents, the market has priced in zero or below zero monetary policy rates for the foreseeable future after this big run up and then quick reversal that we saw in the period of 2016 to 2020. And on the next slide, if we can jump to that one, the Fed during this period has shifted their emphasis away from the traditional measures of economic performance in guiding monetary policy to a framework in which they're really focused on financial conditions. Now, this is important because 
prior to the last financial crisis, if we were talking about how the Fed might change its monetary policy, we would be focused on the outlook for inflation, real GDP, as well as the performance of the labor market. Fast forward to today, the bulk of the conversation that the Fed is having both internally as well as with the market is centered around financial conditions. And financial conditions are comprised of several things, but the biggest mover has been uh, equity market volatility. And so if we move to the next slide, the biggest driver of financial conditions is, is equity vol. And on this slide, we're just looking at the VIX, which is equity volatility versus FCI, which is financial conditions. And equity volatility only spikes when we see the stock market sell off. And you can see the correlation here is pretty straightforward. A spike in equity vol, it translates to a spike or a tightening of financial conditions. And so this is the way in which the Fed has effectively institutionalized the Powell put. So if we know that the Fed isn't going to allow the equity market to sell off significantly without some additional amount of monetary policy stimulus, then the extent to which 10 and 30 year yields will be allowed to increase will be limited. And what I suspect will be very telling is that over the course of the next two to three months, once we get past the presidential election and once we find ourselves with a market looking forward to 2021 and beyond, that we will have upward pressure in the longer end of the curve. And the, this, will, this will be a big litmus test for the equity market's willingness to absorb it and the Fed's willingness to respond if we do see that back up. My baseline assumption is that the Fed would be content to see 1% 10 year yields, all else being equal, but would jump in and do an extension of their weighted average maturity of purchases uh, once we get to call it 125 to 150, because that would correspond with uh, underperformance of risk assets. The caveat that I would add, and I think this is a meaningful one, is that because the most direct way that the Fed uh, monetary policy moves and lowering of interest rates translates through to the consumer is via mortgage borrowing. What has occurred over the course of 2020 is that the mortgage basis has increased. And while we haven't, or we have seen treasury rates ratchet decidedly lower, mortgage rates have fallen, but they haven't fallen to the same extent that one would have traditionally expected. And so if we find the compression, which has already begun, if we find the compression of the mortgage basis corresponds with higher rates, i.e. Mortgage, mortgage rates don't actually change even if 10-year yields drift back up, that would be an environment in which the Fed would take more of a hands-off approach and say, okay, we're happy with rates here, no reason to change the bond buying program. Uh, again, that implies a great deal of positive developments over the course of the uh, of the next few months, but I think it's a very real risk to have on the on the table. Let's move on to the next chart. So the election and the election outcome is going to be certainly when we started 2020, it was the risk of the year. Obviously, the global pandemic has sidelined the, the relevance of the election for much of the trading year. But we're, we're in the, the last 20, last 20, 21 days before the election. And so once again, it has become a major focus. What I have on page on this page is I've just taken a look at the, the relationship between a sitting president or an incumbent being reelected and the unemployment rate. The punchline of this chart is it will be very difficult using this matrix alone to uh, assume that Trump gets reelected given the amount of unemployment that there currently is in the system. If we move on to the next page, 
uh, taking a look, I just, these are not polls, these are the predicted, so the, the, the betting website's odds about the uh, potential election outcomes. So using this as a somewhat better guide than the polls themselves, what we see is at this moment, not only had, does Biden have a, a very significant lead over Trump, but the Senate seems more than much more than likely to go to the Democrats uh, and the House. Is clearly, the expectation is for the House to remain in the hands of the Democrats. We all remember 2016 and the surprise and the big lesson, the big takeaway from a market's perspective was not to put a great deal of faith in the polls and the pundits. And so as we look to November, I think that the market is expecting a period of volatility. And I think that the market is not as willing to put on significant positions based on the actual perceived outcomes. Now, there are plenty of people who are hedging and positioning, positioning in such a way as to mitigate risk, but we much less of a tradable event itself and the perception, and as, as we look at the data, that our takeaway is that people are sidelined once the results are known, they'll start to layer into the trades that make sense given the amount of fiscal stimulus that, that's in the system and the global headwinds facing an economic recovery. The caveat, or not caveat the, the uh, other nuance that I would highlight is we recently did a client survey and we asked the question very specifically, how long do you think it will take before we see the results of the election? So the average was about seven days, but the results were very barbelled. We had a subset of investors who strongly believed that it would be a traditional 24 to 48 hours before we know and the market will move on. We also had on the other end, a variety of clients who expected the process to take uh, several weeks before there was any clear resolution. And so as we consider the election, it's less about who actually ends up in the White House next year, and it's more about how quickly the market gets clarity. And I think that will be an important uh, distinction to make as we go forward. So let's move on to the next chart. Just talking a bit about the, the, the new normal for economic growth. What we have seen is this is just the GD, quarterly GDP over the course of the last 10 years. The second quarter, the, the big red uh, bar, it represents the decline in uh, services and personal spending. Uh, as well as the decline in goods, which is the blue bar below that. And I include this chart simply to highlight that so much of the dramatic drop in real GDP was a function of the service sector. Now, if we, if we decompose, if we uh, deconstruct the uh, hit that the employment market took, we can also see it corresponds very well so the frontline service sector jobs were the first ones that were lost, and those were also the jobs that have been the slowest to come back in, in whatever the version of the new normal is that will be seen. One of the biggest surprises for me was not so much how quickly people begin to retrench their spending, but how comfortable to a large extent, a lot of major employers were willing to transition to a work from home model. And I've been, again, surprised how well and quickly it has occurred. And the success has implications for the eagerness with which employers and employees are, in, are returning to big urban centers. And so, just thinking about some of the big metropolitan areas, it follows intuitively that we would see a transition away from urban centers into the first and second ring suburbs. Now that has accompanied, an, or excuse me, that has occurred at a very swift pace, but the underlying support services 
for those employees, I think the BLS has told us that roughly uh, 25, 24 to 25 percent of the labor force is now working from home. And the support services, whether it's the, the local lunch place or dry cleaning, is always a classic example, or entertainment, uh, restaurants, et cetera, they haven't followed that transition out to the suburbs, or to the first and second ring suburbs. And those jobs and the capital associated with making that transition is a bit stickier. So if we find ourselves in a situation where we are working from home in a comparable capacity with what we had seen in the third quarter of 2020, in the beginning of 2022, or even late 2021, I think that would convince some of those frontline service sectors to to re, or service sector firms to really start to transition uh, further out right now a lot of those jobs seem to be in something of or those institutions seem to be in something of a holding pattern as everyone awaits to uh, the re uh, the emergence on the other side in some version of a new normal if we could go on to the uh, the next slide uh, there's been the the trade war between the administration and some of the U.S.'s biggest trading partners has taken a back seat because of the pandemic. That follows intuitively. However, once we're we are starting to see uh, some of the the trade issues come up once again, and after the election, regardless of the outcome, I would anticipate a refocus on this issue. Uh, the the, the two candidates certainly have a uh, are assumed to have different approaches approaches to international relations and international trade. Uh, however, as a as a takeaway, I think generally speaking, investors in the market are taking a wait and see stance rather than assuming it is going to go decidedly in one direction or the other. We can move forward to the next slide. Uh, Similarly, uh, given the exhaustion of the uh, enhanced unemployment benefits provided by the federal government, the slow progress toward a fiscal bailout 2.0, and the initial spending spur or, or spending spree that resulted once everyone had or 25% of the labor market had to work from home, uh, it will be very telling to see what the next two or three months bring in terms of personal consumption. Uh, this Friday, we do have the retail sales report, and the retail sales report will give us a reasonable glimpse at goods consumption during September. Uh, but again, the, the service aspect of it was the key on the way down, and the service aspect of it will be the key on the way back up. The uh, this chart, the reason that I include it, shows the extent of the drawdown of inventories uh, during this period. Not only were people unwilling to stock up on goods to be sold through whether traditional or online retailers, but there, there was also simply a, a, a difficulty in producing a great deal of that. Now, this speaks to the potential for a bounce back in inventory and consumption that is consistent with a strong third quarter GDP performance. So this will be very defining as to whether or not we have a version or a lighter version of a V-shaped recovery, which I think most people are not expecting to occur in its truest form, uh, but rather a rocky W bounce period of stabilization on another dip seems to be the consensus. And even within that context, the, the notion of a K-shaped recovery does seem to resonate as well. We have seen because that frontline service sector was the first hit, they also are, um, as I pointed out earlier, the hardest to be reintegrated into the market. They're also associated with kind of the, the lower wage earners within the broader economy. And as that aspect struggles, the translation of that into the into other sectors that further up 
the, the corporate structure has occurred, but it hasn't occurred in such a way that has the, the broader data uh, reflecting a, a particularly dire outlook, at least not yet. If we move to the next slide. Uh, I made the observation a bit earlier that at the beginning of the pandemic, expectations were for uh, an even worse economic outcome. And this has also been reflected not only in the US, but also globally. And on um, this chart, what I've done is I've compared the, the surprise indices, so just economic data forecast versus what's realized across a variety of major economies. The U.S. we can see in blue, very sharp increase. Uh, emer emerging markets and China didn't do as well, but still outperformed. Uh, and then we saw uh, uh, the Eurozone as well coming in better than expected. That said, that has started to moderate somewhat. And as it continues to moderate, I think that we will see this broader range for rates being retained, again, front end, very unlikely to change, and even the longer in, in a clear and definable range. So a lot of the optimism is now being priced back out versus the economic data as greater clarity becomes available in, as to what has actually been done in terms of damage to the real economy. So can we move on to the next slide? As I, uh, as I pointed out just a couple moments ago, the composition of who was taken out of the labor market at the beginning has led to some misleading economic data. And this is one that I like to highlight, and that's the real wages. What we saw at the beginning of the pandemic was an increase in the real average hourly earnings and increase in the real weekly earnings. And that's not because it is not, that's not because during the pandemic, everyone got a raise. That's because during the pandemic, the lower wage earners were taken out of this data series. And so we would expect that as those low wage earners get reintroduced into the labor market, we will see continued normalization of this back below that 2 to 3% range. Once we get into this, to the first half of 2020, we would expect a lot of that uh, of that noise to be priced out of this data series, and we'll get a better sense of how the labor market is actually performing. So, if we can move to the next slide, uh, this brings us to one of the the final topics I would really like to to focus on, and that is what has been occurring on the inflation front. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was a very clear concern that prices would enter a deflationary period and that deflationary period would build on itself. And what the data has proven is that didn't occur while we had a couple months where there was sharp downward pressure on inflation that has reversed and we're back to some version of normal levels on a year over year basis. If we move on to the next slide. When we break down what has really been driving inflation, what we saw was the decline in inflation had to do with airfares and apparel in the very beginning. Uh, those haven't rebounded, but they have stabilized. Now, where the, where the real rebound has occurred is it has occurred in shelter costs, which include owner's equivalent rent. And the yellow bar on this chart is uh, auto prices. And if we move to the next slide, the auto prices that matter for core CPI, or this is me, that have been moving core CPI, are used auto prices. Why is this relevant? Because I will characterize this as a residual of the pandemic rather than the true demand side inflation that the Fed wants to see. So what we saw were, were individuals coming to grips with the work from home reality, able to transition from urban centers to suburban centers. And in that process, they realized, oh, I probably need a car or a new car. In addition, we have seen a dramatic decrease in 
people's willingness to uh, take public transportation. So a favoring of private over public conveyance should intuitively bid up the price in the used auto sector, and that's exactly what we have seen. And so once we lose that and lose some of the uh, the price discovery of people relocating out of urban centers into the suburbs, I think that that's where we really will start to look at some of the other demand-driven aspects of inflation to see if we have ultimately made it past without any deflationary or any permanent deflationary pressures, or if that's going to be a, a lingering issue. And if we just move, I think the last chart or the next one will be the last one, uh, and that's the the apparel prices are uh, going to a similar bucket. They only functioning the opposite way. They drag at the beginning, a small bounce after the pandemic, and now let's see over the course of the next several months whether or not that upward pressure on apparel prices that emerged is able to make it through the holiday shopping season and what that ultimately does imply for the uh, the overall direction of of consumption of the overall direction of inflation and then that subsequently circles back to the beginning of the presentation where I made the point that while the front end of the market is going to be in a, in a very tight range the most interesting or the most exciting action will be out in 10s and 30s and be largely a function of the inflation framework, or excuse me, the inflation landscape, and whether or not some of these early signs of life in the inflation complex have room to run. And just the other, sorry, the other last couple, this chart and then the next one i believe there's one more in there um show the the fact that while historically there has been a great deal of foreign sponsorship for u.s treasuries uh, that has waned in recent years and uh, for example china hasn't been a net buyer of treasuries for a very long time and Japan has stepped up their interest in treasuries, but that has only been uh, in the last few months, and I wouldn't actually expect that to uh, be something that one would characterize as durable. So the uh, what I what I found to be fascinating is the subset of the market that has really replaced that demand has been a the Fed via QE. That that uh, that much is evident, but we've also seen domestic banks and domestic investment funds become far larger player players in the treasury market than they were before the pandemic, and that does bode well for the Treasury Department's need to underwrite an ever increasing deficit, as it were. And that really does cover all of the uh, the comments that I wanted to make about this state of the economy, our, our projections going forward. I believe that there's, uh, we do have, I will transition this back. There we go. Thank you, Ian. Um, just so you know, Ian will be available later for the question and answer period. So um, if you have questions for him, please put those into your question box. Uh, next up is my presentation. So if we could move to the next one. Uh, so what's new in life? We've had a bunch of changes, <laughs> aside from the very last one on the end of this slide. Um, but we've raised our lace cap. That happened in January 1st to $75 million. And um, I'm sure a lot of you want to go higher than that. And, of course, you can always send me an email, and I will let the treasurer know. Um, the other thing is, is we offer emergency accounts. That's uh, for those with a PG&E wildfire settlement payment. Uh, and I'll show you later on where that information is on our website. And then we offer emergency accounts for the CARES Act funds that your agency may have received. Those, um, it, that one's especially helpful because I know that 
the federal government has been requiring that you keep that money separate and any interest you earn has to be used for that also. So we offer a separate account where that information can be um, provided to you completely separate from your normal uh, LACE account. And the other thing is, of course, the big one, when Uncle COVID came to down, we all decided to work from home. Um, if you can move to the next frame, that's been interesting. So that kind of leads us into where we are now um, and how to reach LACE during uh, working from home orders. We've got, I've got all of our numbers here and they're, they're of course available on the website, but this one has who has what number so you know who you're gonna call. Um, and please, please be patient with us. Uh, we originally had these really old uh, flip phones that they were only meant for emergencies, so not a big deal, but who knows that this emergency would last, what, eight months now? So um, please be patient with our staff. They are working with what they have. Uh, but here are all of the phone numbers. And the other option is, is please sign up for online. We, um, I'll show you where that is later also. But uh, we've, we've definitely got that, and you can always send us an email. And um, my, you can always send me an email too. That's not a problem. If you could go to the next theme. So um, what are we doing with LACE money? I don't know if all of you know, because uh, I know that other uh, pooled money uh, investment accounts available to agencies in other states, they do it with just the money from the agencies. Ours is different in that we add your money to the state's other money, the general fund and something we call SMIF which is surplus money investment account. And that's kind of uh, funny because it's not really surplus money, it's idle money um, from departments. So uh, that takes up about 50%. And then there's LACE at 31% and the general fund at 18. And then that little sliver of other, which is 0.28% and that's a special fund and that sort of thing. But we take all of that and um, invest it for you every day. And uh, Tracy is gonna talk later. She's in the room with me, so that's why I keep looking over there. Um, she's, she's gonna talk later about what we're, um, how we decide what to invest in. If we can move to the next slide. So what we are investing in, um, currently as of August 31st, we had $113.8 billion portfolio but we've got commercial paper, time deposits, certificate CDs, excuse me, banknotes, agencies, and agencies are your um, uh, federal home loan bank, that sort of thing, and then treasuries and loans. And tr uh, Tracy and Jeff are probably gonna get into more detail about what it is that we're investing in and why we invest in those. Um, this, this information is all available on our website, and I'll show you where that is later. If you could move to the next slide. This is the LAFE's quarterly performance, including as part of PMIA. Um, the apportionment rate is 1.47, and it's for the quarter ended 30, 2020. The PMIA quarter to date is 1.41%. The average life is 191 days, and the LAFE fair, va fair value factor is 1.01. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So here's some other um, housekeeping stuff. Uh, because we are working from home, we run into several things that have kind of tripped us up and you know slowed us down from being able to help you. Uh, the biggest thing is deposits. When making a deposit, know your wire limit. Please, please know your wire limit. It's kind of caused some of our staff to have to backtrack and void transactions. If your bank can't uh, do the transaction amount that you're requesting, we have to back the transaction out and void it and restart over. That kind of just slows everything down. So um, know your wire limit, your PIN number, agency name, hopefully you know that, um, the effective date of your wire, your deposit amount, and your bank name. And the big one that's not listed on here is making sure that you don't um, send your wire until you've actually started a transaction with us. Once the transaction has been started with us, you'll know the effective date of that transaction, and then you can go back to your bank and wire the money to us and make sure that your wire is for the same effective date. 
we can't, um, I'm sure our cash management team will be happy to hear this because um, we can't receive money too early and we can't receive money late. So um, it needs to be the same effective date. And same information for withdrawals. Um, and then the other big thing that we've run across is updated information. Um, people have been wanting to deposit money and everybody that we have listed for them no longer works there. So please take the time and um, update your contact information if you've had any turnover at all. Um, all of the forms for that are available on our website. And we can't, um, for cybersecurity reasons, we can't relax our, uh, our requirements. We need wet signatures to make those changes. Um, and it's best that you do it as soon as you realize you have some turnover. Um, miscellaneous information, if you want to make your transaction for the same day, it has to be completed by 10 a.m. our uh, California time. Um, you can always schedule a transaction up to 10 days in advance. Um, and like I said earlier, please initiate your wire after you've completed your wire, um, your transaction with LACE. Um, other things that I've already said. And then um, you... Also something that our cash management team would like to hear is um, if you have a transaction for more than 10 million, please let us know beforehand. Um, and then transactions must be a minimum of $5,000 and in increments of 1,000 after that. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So the next slide is, is me taking you out to the internet. So here's my screen. And this is our website. So this is the LAFE website. I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to look that over. We have, of course, all of the emergency phone lines available on here that you can call um, and you can, our email addresses. Um, if you look on the left, there is the link to LAFE Online that takes you here. And we have instructions on how to, um, to sign up if you aren't already. We have our meetings and agenda schedule for the uh, board, um, our webinar, of course, <laughs> our LAFE uh, website, and then all of our contact information. Uh, other things are participants, who's participating in LAFE, um, balances for each of those, just a little information for analysis. But by far the biggest thing is information that you might need as forms. We've got this here, so if you want to make an address change, authorization change, all of those forms are here. If you we find this helpful. This is a transaction checklist. It helps people, you know, if, you know, before you call or before you start your transaction online, you know, complete and make sure you have all of this information. It's there for you. Um, the other thing is is um, procedures for a LAFE transaction. Also has all of that information available for you. Uh, LAFE statutes. I don't know if you know this, but if you go down to the right, down to the very bottom, um, but the state of California cannot touch your money. They can look at it, they can't touch it, and it's in law. So those are our laws. We have our board members. There's the treasurer. Hello all to these people. They're probably listening, I hope. <laughs> And um, other performance information. So some of this information was in my presentation. This is all here for you to see. Um, online statements are here. Interest statements, that takes you to a link to the controller's office. Um, we have our calendar. Monday was a bank holiday. That information is all on here. And then also policy reminders, things I just got over. <laughs> um, information on how to calculate your quarterly interest earnings, that sort of thing. 
And then the other thing is that, you know, like I said earlier, LACE is a part of the PMIA. Information regarding the entire portfolio is available under the PMIA. And you go here and there's reporting documents, our investment policy, um, the authorized securities, and information regarding those. Our website has a wealth of information and um, it's, it's interesting, I, and I didn't realize it until I started preparing for this, but we have so much here. Uh, we have the market valuation, monthly reports, going back for years. But this kind of information kind of gives you an idea of what investment data, you know, that we have, what we've been doing with your money, where it goes. So please take the time to go out to our website. It has a ton of information. If we could switch back to the presentation. Hello. So if we can go to the next slide. So here's our emergency numbers again. <laughs> and my email address, if you have questions for me, that's totally great. I answer my emails like within 20 minutes, top. I'm really good about that. So if you have questions for me, by all means, email me. And then the link to our website is right there. So um, if you have questions, like I said, please put those into the question box. Lily is here, and she's across from me. That's why I'm looking over here. And um, she's going to be reading them out later on during the question and answer period. So next up is my very new director, Kristen, and she just was appointed in January by Treasurer Ma. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> and she's going to be handling the next part of this presentation. Thank you, Christina. Um, yes, this part of the presentation is going to talk a lot about how your money is being invested and in, in the investment management process. And it's going to be a – next slide, please. It's going to be a joint presentation uh, by myself and our assistant director, Jeff Worm, and our credit manager, Tracy Payne. Next slide. So my part of the presentation is to give you a high-level overview of how we invest your money. Uh, part of this presentation will include just what our overall investment management plan is, what factors and uh, other types of information drive this investment plan, how the investment landscape has changed dramatically over the past year. For those of you that attended our LACE uh, conference last year, you may have noticed that the title to this presentation is exactly the same. Well, I didn't have to work very hard to change it because what a difference a year makes. So I'm going to provide you with some statistics that just show you how things have changed over the past year. And then finally, regardless of all these changes and the uncertainty in our world today, why you should still be very assured that your money is being very prudently managed. Next slide. So I'm going to start today just talking a little bit about at a high level overview of how your money is being invested. As Christina indicated and gave you some charts on, LAIF um, monies are part of a much larger government account that we use to invest your funds. It's commingled with the general fund as well as SMIF, the surplus money investment fund, which is monies that state agencies put into these accounts to, to be invested because they're not used for immediate use. The purpose of the PMIA when it was originally created was to be a very uh, liquid and uh, just very safe liquid man cash management account. So we manage these monies, your monies as well as the rest of the PMIA as a short-term investment pool, which means that we keep the average life of this pool fairly short, less than a year, and we invest in the types of investments that give us a great deal of liquidity. Among these investments, what our, what our primary go-to um, and what you would say is the gold standard for safety and liquidity are government securities, and mainly treasury bills and treasury notes. And in addition to this, as Christine also indicated, we rely um, quite heavily on agencies, uh, government-sponsored agencies, as well as supranationals, such as Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Home Loan Bank, and World Bank. These offer us really highly uh, rated good quality investments, but they also provide us with a great deal of flexibility because of the fact that we have to meet certain cash management needs and the treasuries and the 
bills, bills and notes only mature on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So the agencies give us that flexibility to invest on other, to get maturities that are invested on other days. In addition to the, the government securities and the agencies, we also invest in highly rated capital market instruments. And Tracy will be talking in a few minutes about how we go about doing that credit analysis. But these investments, which include certificates of deposits and commercial paper, are they fall into the top three uh, credit rating uh, agency categories by at least two rating agencies. Uh, in addition to this, uh, these working with these types of investments, our strategy also includes uh, to work very closely with our cash management division. We talk to them at least twice a day, sometimes multiple times a day, depending on where the cash flow is going. Um, and we do this particularly because we want to make sure that we invest in the types of investments that provide competitive returns, but that also, um, first and foremost, are safe and liquid. Because we want to ensure that when the time comes for you to withdraw your money, the money's there for you as well as for the other agencies. Next slide. So in addition to the uh, government securities as well as the uh, non-government non capital market securities, we also, the Tre State Treasurer's Office also, also runs a time deposit program as part of the PMIA, which provides investments in local communities. The state operates this program as a voluntary program for which uh, banks, credit unions, as well as savings and loans that are headquartered in California can participate. And what happens is we take money from the PMIA and we deposit it into those financial institutions. And in order to participate in the program, the bank or credit union or saving loans has to contact us. And then our time deposit team does a very extensive credit analysis of the, um, the bank to ensure the safety of your money. And then based upon that accredited analysis, we establish a rate and a term structure for the investment of those funds of when they are returned to us. And so right now we have about $5 billion invested in local community institutions and about over across the state, about 69 community institutions and banks, credit unions and savings and loans. Next slide. So now I'm gonna turn a little bit to uh, talking about some of the factors that influence our investment decisions. We don't have any in-house economists uh, doing forecasting for us, but what we do have is quite a number of the banks that we work very closely with providing us daily with economic forecasts. And we also rely on information from Bloomberg and Thomson and Reuters to guide our investment decisions. Uh, particularly, we follow the, the yield curve is one of the main things that we do look at. And one, the chart that's in front of you right now is one of the bellwethers that economists use for predicting recessions. And the vertical shaded areas uh, reflect over the last four years when there has been a recession. And what this chart shows you is the spread between the two-year constant maturity treasury and the 10-year constant maturity treasury. And you'll see um, there's a fairly accurate predicting predicting ability of this of this measure because every time that drops below zero, which means that the curve is actually inverted, uh, the two-year rate is higher than the 10-year, within six to 12 months, there has been a recession. Why is this useful to us? Why is it useful to follow what yield curves are doing? Well, it's a useful gauge knowing where we are in the business cycle, how strong the economy is, and basically it guides us as to where we want um, the portfolio to be as far as the types of investments that we want to purchase as well as where the average life of the portfolio should be to ensure that it's, it's meeting our expectations with the safety and liquidity needs of the pool. Next slide. In addition to the economic indicators, we've also followed the actions of the Federal Reserve and also Fed speak the pronouncements of its chair, Jerome Powell. And in the past six months, uh, the Fed has been particularly active, playing a very active role in trying to curb the downturn in the economy and also to prevent it from falling into a deeper recession. One of the particular concerns we've had, and as well as the Fed has had, is market liquidity. Uh, early on in the uh, crisis with the uh, pandemic, there was a lot of volatility at the short end of the curve, which is where we're investing a lot of, uh, of our monies. And so watching that and watching the actions of the Fed trying to control the liquidity and trying to loosen up um, the credit for the banks to stabilize the market, we saw the rates drop dramatically. And so that has impacted our investment strategy, which Jeff will talk about a little bit more in detail. So this is a, it is a key factor that we do consider when we do our investments. Next slide. 
Well, as the, the title of the uh, presentation has, has indicated what a difference a year makes, and so I thought it'd be interesting to put up a slide that just shows how dramatically the landscape has changed from August of 2019 to August of 2020. Over the course of that this past year, as you could see, the PMIA um, grew about $20 billion, in large part due to the money that we've received from CARES Act from the federal government, as well as the fact that the timing of our uh, income tax revenues was de delayed, so that affected the cash flow, and so therefore a lot of that money still resides in the Treasury. And also late has grown dramatically, about $7 billion over the course of the year. Uh, part of that is uh, due to the approval by Treasurer Ma of increasing the individual length of life accounts by $10 million. But we also believe there is that, that factor that uh, the PMIA tends to trail uh, other types of similar types of investments when rates begin to decline and making it a better investment opportunity. So we feel much of that money is also as a, as, is in the pool because of that reason. The monthly average yield also, um, because of the actions of the Fed and its impact on the economy and impact on markets, has dropped, as you can see, from in August of 2019 at about 2.3% to now, or in August of 2020, about three quarters, a little over three quarters of a percent. And underlying that are the changes in the actual investments. And I put two indicators in there for you to look at, just the, and which I'm sure you're, you're very well aware of, just the dramatic drop in the effective federal funds rate as well as the, the constant uh, treasury maturity. And as Ian indicated uh, in his uh, analysis, it doesn't look like these, these very short or end of the curve rates are gonna change anytime soon. Next slide. So we've experienced all of us, uh, you know, quite a bit of uncertainty over the past year, particularly the last six months. And there still is a lot of concern and also uncertainty over where things are going with the economy. And, you know, we've had to adapt our strategy as well as, as most of you. But what I want you to um, hear from all of us, and, and that's why the slide is here, is that even though we've had a lot of that uncertainty, the core principles still remain of how your money is being invested. Namely, firm adherence to California statute. The statute has not changed. It still guides the investments that we invest in the credit quality of those investments, and the maturity length of those investments. We also, on our investment policy, which you can view on our website that Christina showed you, our investment policy is more conservative than statute. For example, California statute allows us to invest out to 30 years in treasury maturities. However, our policy restricts that to no further than five years. But even more so, we, we depending on the environment, we're going to take even a more conservative approach than what our policy um, allows us to. Uh, and in this environment, we don't invest out five years. There's no benefit to you and to the pool for investing out five years. So we're much more restrictive currently than what, um, what policy provides for. You should also know that the staff that is managing your money has quite a bit of experience, very broad and deep experience, are nine authorized um, investment traders has collectively 183 years worth of uh, work experience, which averages out to about 20 years per person. And most of that has been with the state treasurer's office. We have not only portfolio management experience, but we have staff with cash forecasting experience, securities clearance experience, uh, bond finance experience, as well as just financial services experience. And this has really been invaluable during this time period because that knowledge and experience along with our team approach has really helped us make that transition into a teleworking environment where we've had to use online uh, platforms in order to conduct our investments. So finally, the last point I'd like to make is that in the end, as Christina said, you know, your money is safe. Uh, statute prohibits the state from taking your money and your, guarantee, your principal is guaranteed to go back to you. Um, we do operate a cash management investment pool, but as a life participant, your principal will be returned to you at the end of the day when you need to return it, when you need to withdraw it. So for these reasons, we just want to make sure that you, are rest, you can feel rest assured that your money is safely being invested and prudently invested. So now I'm going to, next slide, turn the presentation over to Jeff Worm, and he's going to talk a little bit more in detail about how your money is being invested. There I am. Hey, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm honored to be able to present to you again. Uh, 
a little different this year. We're looking forward to doing another in-person conference. Those are a lot of fun to get to meet all of you face-to-face, but uh, still getting the opportunity to talk to you is, uh, is going to be fulfilling today for us. And we hope if you have questions, please be ready to ask. Um, we're ready to answer those questions. There's not much left of our presentation, so if you have questions, you can go ahead and start um, sending them in to us, and we'll be ready to start passing those out to the appropriate people at the end of our presentation. Um, my first slide here I'd like to share, uh, and thank Christina for introducing it on <laughs> when she went to the website. This is a part of our monthly report, so every month you can review this. This is one of the first pages in our monthly report. It kind of shows an overview of how uh, the pool is broken down by investment securities. Um, Kristen mentioned our investment policy. It's the, the three inve- uh, goals in the investment policy, first and foremost is safety, uh, secondarily would be liquidity, and lastly would be is yield. And if you look at this breakdown, you can see uh, as of June 30, our fiscal year end, we had over 52% of the portfolio in treasuries and another oh, oh, 20% in agencies. So 73% of the investments that we have in the entire pool is either going to be a U.S. Treasury security or a federal agency security. And then if you look, another 5% in our time deposit program. Pretty sure this was mentioned by Kristen, but those, all those deposits are collateralized. So they are fully guaranteed that, to get our investment back. Um, it's a great program. It's an opportunity for the treasurer to invest in local communities here in California. Um, and then this is another situation where policy is a little tighter in government code. Government code only requires a bank to have a branch in California. Our investment policy requires these banks to be headquartered in California. We really want it to be um, an opportunity to really have a relationship with these local and smaller communities and smaller investment uh, 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 financial institutions here in California. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, this will show you a breakdown of where we were 10 years ago uh, in June 30, and as of June 30 this year, and then I have a 10-year average column. As you can see, the more things change, the more they stay the same. There isn't anything that really stands out that's changed a lot over the 10 years. Um, you can see that we're a little heavier weighted in agencies this year than we have been recently. Um, not sure that there really isn't any reason for it other than the fact the portfolio has grown a lot and we really do lean towards uh, the safety as it being the first part of our investment policy. And we found a lot of opportunities to hit dates that we know we're going to need um, where treasuries aren't available to uh, help us there. Uh, the other piece I'd like to point out, if you look at towards the bottom, loans have changed a lot. Um, a lot of that is the economy got better in California. There wasn't a lot of need for general fund loans to be handed out. Um, or, or to help get through times like they were 10 years ago in the middle of the financial crisis. Um, and as you see, the 10-year average is at 3%. Um, what I'd like to point out on this when it comes to the loans, there's two things that are not included in this because they're not tracked inside the portfolio. And it's SB84 and AB1054. The SB84 was the PERS and SERS kind of advanced loan that is going to be paid back over time. Um, they are making payments to us. And then the AB 1054 is the wildfire and utilities relief fund that was started. Um, that's where you're seeing the boost in your quarterly earnings. Uh, never before this, when these loans happened outside the pool, was the PMIA earnings below what you are receiving in your quarterly uh, distributions. And that's why you're seeing the bump. Um, they're not managed by us internally here, but the money the earnings from those loans do get swept back into the quarterly distribution. And again, I just want to make sure that that you guys understand that that's temporary. It could be a long temporary as it comes to SB84. If they have up to 13 years to pay that back, Uh, the AB1054 portion could be coming back a lot sooner. It was really intended to be about a year, which we just passed. Uh, I know they're working hard to kind of get that paid back. So that little bump is going to be getting a little bit less than you're seeing, but it's still going to be there uh, going forward for for the time being. Next slide, please. this slide shows you the breakdown of the portfolio um, over these 10 years that I just showed you the average of. Uh, just a couple of highlights I'd like to point out while we're here. Um, and things change, and uh, our our thought process and how we invest changes, as you can see, over time. If you go back to 2012, there's a couple of things there in the bar I'd like to point out. Agencies, which is the, the first bar above the bottom bar, or which is the blue treasury part, um, at that time, it's the smallest amount that we've had over this 10-year run. It was less than 7% of the portfolio. At that time, they weren't in the market and weren't very active. So, again, a lot of these things are driven not by our choice, but by what is available to us and the size of the portfolio also. And if you look, commercial paper at that time was less than 5%. That was more of an internal choice on our part. Um, 
lot of concerns in the market and there was a, a credit crunch and a little bit of a credit freeze out there. And so some things weren't available and some things we were just making the conscious choice to stay away from. And if you look here towards the end on the last bar here, um, CDs, uh, it's the smallest amount that we've had in, in quite some time. Uh, a lot of that is um, kind of what's available on the market. If you look at the effect COVID's had on institute financial institutions, they don't have a liquidity need right now. They have tons of deposits in place because there's not a lot of activity going on and they're not having to write a lot of loans right now. I'll go to the next slide, please. Um, this is something we introduced a few conferences ago. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like on the Treasury maturity schedule for what we have on the portfolio. I moved this one out to September 30, um, just to give you an idea. What's interesting is all the green numbers are our Treasury bill positions, the blue numbers are our Treasury note positions. Um, as the Fed has been introducing more and more Treasury securities into the market um, for multiple reasons. Um, when they introduced the five month Treasury bill, which slid to Tuesday, that gave us uh, a lot more options to try and hit some down dates that we didn't have an opportunity before when treasuries were only on Thursdays, uh, treasury bills only on Thursdays. And so you see there's quite a bit there in the next five months because we've been taking advantage of that investment opportunity out there. If you look at the bottom, it tells you in the next 12 months, starting on September 30, $52.7 billion worth of our treasury portfolio will be maturing. But again, we are continuously adding those back on. So it's not like this is going to change the structure of the portfolio. <clears throat> One of the biggest reasons we carry so much in treasuries is it's like carrying cash. It helps our liquidity. We always know that we can go to the market. The treasury market's open every single day. And if we really needed to, for any reason, we could um, sell some of these securities back into the market. So this is just a way for us to carry cash and make sure that we have the flexibility to meet everyone's needs, the state's needs, and our, our local agency investment fund partners' needs. And I'm done talking about the super safe, secure part of our portfolio. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to our credit manager, Tracy Payne, who gets the responsibility of uh, the more challenging portion of our portfolio. <laughs> okay. So since our most important investment goal is safety, we monitor the credit strength of the investments on a daily basis to ensure that the PMIA is protected. The PMIA has very high quality credit standards and the securities we purchase must be of prime quality and rated by at least two nationally recognized rating organizations. The credit rating agency services that we subscribe to are Moody's, S&P, and Fitch. And these services enable us to monitor our approved investments very closely because for each issuer, they provide us a credit analysis, financials, performance report, and industry outlook. Next slide. About 20% of the current portfolio are certificates of deposit and commercial paper. Certificates of deposit can be issued by either domestic banks or foreign banks that are licensed in the United States. And commercial paper can be issued by banks, corporations, and limited liability companies. Next slide. We currently have about 100 Certificate of Deposit and Commercial Paper issuers that are approved by the PMIA. And on a daily basis, we are monitoring these approved investments very thoroughly to ensure that the PMIA is safe. We use several resources so that we can obtain as much information as possible to ensure we know and understand the stability and the financial strength of the institutions issuing the securities as well as the economy and the banking industry as a whole. In addition to accessing credit information from the rating agencies, we also have subscriptions to Reuters and Bloomberg and other reliable news sources. And weekly, I consolidate the critical information from these sources to provide credit updates for the traders in order to keep them informed of events that occurred. This could be rating changes, financial performance results, or some other event or major headline. And all of this information, whether positive or negative, can generate a change in our investment strategy. Sometimes that strategy can be subtle, such as how much we are investing or the length of time of, for an investment. Other times it can be more straightforward, such as if we stop investing in them completely until a deficiency is resolved. 
Obviously, this year, the major headlines are largely related to the impact of the pandemic on the economy, and we want to assure you that all throughout this, we have continued to be cautious to ensure our investments are safe. Next slide. In order to continue to enhance the PMIA's safety, liquidity, and yield, we are always looking for additional certificates of deposit and commercial paper programs to add to the list of approved investments. When looking for new programs, we first and foremost must ensure that they are in compliance with the government code and the PMIA investment policy. Then we complete a comprehensive credit analysis, which would include evaluating their financials and analyzing the changes over time, analyzing their ongoing performance and comparing them to their competitors, evaluating their ratings and comparing their ratings history to where they are now, and also looking for any news or current events and evaluating what impact those have. We also look for fairly large programs. For commercial paper, our holdings cannot exceed 10% of the program's outstanding. So the program size has to be significant. And for certificates of deposit, the banks should be a pretty significant size to ensure safety. Over the last year, a few programs that we've added are UPS, Merck, Natixis, and Amazon. Next slide. Adding new issuers is also important because it provides us an opportunity for additional diversity in the portfolio. And this image shows, as of June 30, the diverse exposure we have geographically with certificates of deposit and co commercial paper combined. Since some of the institutions on the improved list can be headquartered in, a, in other countries, we do monitor the economy and banking industries in not only North America, but also Europe, Japan, and Australia. Next slide. As of June 30, we had commercial paper investments in 26 different programs, and that is the graph on the left. Some of the larger holdings were with Toyota, Apple, JP Morgan, and MUFG. And we had certificates of deposit investments in 36 different financial institutions. And the graph on the right shows you what that diversity looks like. Our largest exposures are generally with domestic banks. So you can see by all the color variety that even though we have strict high quality credit standards, we are still able to keep some diversity. I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Okay, so here, I'll go to the next slide please. Here's where I'm gonna have a little bit of uh, fun. We're gonna do a, let's go back to a simpler time a long four years ago and look at when the Fed met uh, in their meeting in June of 2016, where they felt rates would be going. This is the, I don't know how many of you have access to Bloomberg. You can look at the, their, what they call the dot plot. And uh, I, I, it's a, for me, it's more fun to look back because we don't know what's going to happen going forward. And it helps me kind of figure out what we can do with this information and uh, kind of utilize it. So at that time, um, uh, Bill Dowell was the director and I was working with him as a, the deputy director or assistant director in the division. And we kind of were online with their, their thoughts. We thought rates were going to continue to go up. Um, and things were looking great. Uh, I think if you look at this, um, they thought by 2018, rates would be right around 2.5%. And we'll go to the next slide, please. So let's see what really happened. This was our, our chart that we put on our website on June of 2018. Uh, the Fed funds rate was right around 1.81% yeah, 1 1 that, that they were pretty close, uh, right in line with where things were going. Um, I also like to show this slide to remind people, which has been mentioned already, due to the fact that our portfolio is larger and we have an average life that sticks around six months, 180 days, we trail the market a little bit. So when the Fed funds moves, we're a little bit slower to react to that. So you can kind of see, we'll, we'll post this um, on our website regularly. You can see where things are. The only thing that we can think of to, and I hate using the word comparison, but to add to this slide would be the S&P GIF index. They aren't really the same. Their average life is really, really short compared to what we are, but they do invest in the same types of securities. So that's why that one's on this on the website. Next slide, please. So let's move forward. Okay, so now we're in June of 2018. The Fed meets again, and they put out their dot plots, and now they're thinking that by 2020, rates are going to be around 
for those of you who joined us for our webinar or our conference at that time, Bill and I were right in agreement with them. We thought rates were going to continue to go up. Um, we were kind of thinking that things were going to get to about 3% and not stop, kind of the same thing the Fed was thinking. And uh, we know how that turned out. Let's roll to the next slide, please. And here we are. Um, rates are not at 3%. <laughs> um, Fed funds rate is down to seven uh, basis points. And that what I'm not, I'm not really trying to throw stones. What I want to say is with the information that we're given at each opportune time to kind of forecast forward, we don't know what can put a change in that. Um, and this is where I'm going to make all of you members of the Fed. I'm going to introduce a polling question here in a second. You're all going to get to take a choice on where you think rates will be in 2022. Um, I'm giving you four options uh, currently where they are, zero to 25 basis points, two 50 basis points to 1%, three would be 1% above, or please nobody pick negative. But I put it on there in case you want to be uh, uh, a little bit on that side because we hear concerns about that. And believe me, we're aware of it. We're studying about it. We're talking to people like Ian, who is with us today. What his thoughts are, does he think it can happen, how long would it happen, you know, what kind of impact it can have. And we're trying to formulate plans, that, you know, the more that information comes out. And so, uh, one, I'd really like it if you guys could participate in this poll. So I know you're listening to us and, and having fun with us. And this is just fun. Nobody's going to be graded on it. Nobody's going to be judged for it. Um, and I'll tell you exactly where I think um, we're going to be or where I, I – so there's two ways to look at it. Where I hope we're going to be versus where I think we're going to be are two answers I can give um, and I don't know if I've dragged this on long enough to make sure that people have had a chance to respond. Um, I know you've kind of been uh, led, or was what's the term that we hear all the time, somebody leading their witness when you've heard, if you paid attention to Ian, and, and Kristen mentioned it, and I've kind of mentioned it, so let's see where we are. All right, so 40% think they're going to stay where they are now, and that's where the Fed thinks we're going to be. We've got 47% are right where I think we're going to be. I think I think things are going to get better in the next two years. Um, again, based on the information we have today, I understand why the Fed's saying what they say. I think we're going to find a way to get things better. We should be, I'm hoping, and I also think we're going to be in that 50 uh, base point to 1% range. Um, I can always hope for above 1%. I think we all like to invest when rates are a little bit higher. <laughs> so thank you for participating. I appreciate everybody doing that, and we'll move on back to the rest of my presentation. Um, next slide. And as we talk about the Fed just met, and look, they don't agree with you. There's a couple of people who think, uh, two, two members of the Fed think rates will be a, above where they are in two years, um, but long forecast out, they're back in that 2% range. And I just want to have a little fun with everybody, and that's why I showed it. So this next slide, um, I'm showing you historically, this is normal for us. Um, I'm sorry, the next slide, if we can. Um, we do trail. Um, when rates were going up from 2000, this is a, a from 2005 to 2010, rates were going up. The PMI was trailing it and lagging behind. Then rates dropped when we hit the financial crisis in 2008. But look, the PMI trailed behind it. And as I mentioned, we trailed going on the way back up. We do try to stay as, uh, I, I use the term light on our feet as possible for what is now a $110 billion portfolio. It's not so easy, but it's still part of what we do. Next slide, please. I have an overlay here of uh, three different time frame yield curves to give you an idea of where we've been and, and what we're dealing with now. Um, I'll just pick the, the very top one, the kind of amber colored one. That was June 30 of 2018, uh, the Treasury yield curve. And at that time, we took a conscious effort of what I picked out as the steepest part of the curve right before it started to flatten out. So we were buying a lot more two and three year Treasuries during this investment time because you get a lot more earnings for the time frame that you're locking it up and we we're able to do that and if you look at the bottom curve on this chart the flattest of them all is where we are as of june 30 this year and there's really no benefit for your dollars the state dollars for us to invest in that two to three year arena and we've been buying much more of the treasury bills anywhere one year and in and just kind of turning cash over waiting for that Time frame that I think that we're going to get to where things will get better and we'll start seeing a yield curve again that Ian was mentioning um, where he was mentioning steepening the curves a little further than we like to invest and actually further than we can go policy wise in that 10 to 30 but eventually that that steepening is going to hit in our into our two to three year range and we'll start buying those again and and adding more of them to our portfolio let's go to the next slide 
Um, this is just a look over the last 20 years what the Fed fund rate has done. As you can see, they are quick to respond when they need to to stimulate an economy, and then they take the slow and steady approach back up to make sure that they don't overshoot it. And it's almost the same, just a little bit different, um, just that long flat zone that I was just talking about that we were in for a long period of time. Just wanted to show it to you to share. Next slide. This next item is on our website. Um, it's our maturity schedule. Um, because most of my information was from June 30, I went ahead and used that one. What I'll point out, and it's something that we point out every time we, we meet with you again, um, liquidity is incredibly important. We want to make sure that we meet your needs, and not just your needs. The state's cash flow need is changing every day. Kristen can attest to that as, as she was in the cash management division for a long time. And the, there are things that hit us and also hit um, the local agencies the same way. I mean, your cash flow changes, and we know we need to be available to meet that. So if you look at the bottom line there, um, in the next four months, starting on, on July 1st, 50, over 50% 50 of the portfolio is going to mature. So even though the portfolio is large, and yes, we do invest out the curve a little bit, a lot of this is turning over in a very short amount of time. And I just want to share that. So next slide. Um, things that we pay attention to, and again, these don't push what we do, but they factor into what we think about when we are investing. Nobody wants to talk about COVID, but it's on there. Um, just a reminder that for those of you, if you've received CARES money and you don't have a place to put it, you can invest it with us. Um, it's a secondary account. You just, we have the applications on our website, and you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, the fires have impacted everyone, I'm sure, and we do listen to the Fed. Um, Bill always likes to say, you can't fight the Fed, so we don't. We just listen to them very carefully. <laughs> um, next slide just shows you what a typical barbell investment strategy is, where you invest a little bit short and a little bit long. Um, in today's world, I'm not, we're not doing that here in the investment division. Next slide. We're much more weighted on the front end of the curve, so it's super strong, and it's really heavy over there. And um, same slide that we just showed, but it hasn't changed. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I, I think what we do uh, works. Um, we work together. We adjust to what goes on in the marketplace, uh, to what fits the state's needs and what fits our local investment uh, team needs. And that's it for our presentation. I don't know if I need to pass it back. If everybody would like to hop on, do we have questions? I wasn't. Yeah, next that. slide. Oh, next slide. Sorry. Yeah, we just have a couple of parting thoughts for you. Oh, something happened to the slide. There they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just some fun parting thoughts for you, and just to thank you all for uh, coming. And that this is this is the end of our part of the presentation. As Jeff said, we're going to take some question and answers, and we just wanted to let you all know that we really do value and trust your. Um, your, your willingness to invest in us and you trust our abilities to invest and safeguard your money. And uh, we will just keep carrying on through this time frame and take care and take a steady approach to managing your money. So next slide. That's our contact information in case you need would like to call us and talk to us. And then next slide. We're ready to take some questions and answer. I didn't have that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, we have a question from Tyler Cook. He says, we have always given late 24 hours notice on withdrawals over 10 million. But does late also need 24 hour notice of deposits over 10 million? Oh. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you handle that one, Chris. <laughs> well, actually, first, let me ask everybody to come back on the, the screen. Ian, if you would join us, and Tracy, great. I'm sorry, would you repeat the question again yes. one more time, since we had this little thing here? Tyler Cook asks, we have always given LAPE 24 hours notice of withdrawals over 10 million, but does LAPE also need 24 hour notice of deposits over 10 million? From a cash management perspective, it would be very helpful because as a team, uh, you know, we deal with these last minute changes in cash flow and our invest our cash management team, which is on the third floor in this building, they struggle on a day to day basis in managing and trying to give us the most accurate information as possible. So to the extent that you are able to give us that information on deposits, we would very much appreciate it. It helps us with managing the money much more effectively. Anybody else want to? Uh, I mean, well, as nobody's gonna be punished for it, yeah. but it, it really no. is helpful <laughs> yeah. to, to let us know that. Um, there are times that we're asked to go back in the market late in the day. I don't know how many of you try to do that. Options are super limited, and it's uh, 
you know, you kind of press against it and kind of at the, at the will of what the market has left. So um, knowing as much as we can really helps a lot in what we're doing for your money and for the face money. Okay. Our next question comes from Mark Bray. He asks, can you consider raising the lace cap to 100 million? <laughs> <laughs> we knew that was coming. <laughs> um, what we can do is we can share that with the treasurer. That yeah. really is the treasurer's decision. It is. Um, more than happy to share that information. She did ask um, if we thought this question was coming, and I said, of course it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will let her know that, that you've asked. And again, we'll take a very long look at that and, and share all the information we can with her. Yeah. And she seemed amenable the last time we met over the 75. Yep. So. And that's it. We don't have any more questions that we received during the webinar. Really? I mean, you guys have a chance to talk to someone like Ian. You can ask him anything about the market. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, Ian, where, where, do you feel the same the Fed does? Do you honestly think that rates are going to stay that low for two straight years, or do you think there's a possibility, depending on the outcome of an election, if there is a change or if there isn't, things can change? I know our current president loves super low interest rates, and I think he'd encourage that. Um, if it does change, I don't know that the other side feels the same with that. Do you think that could loosen that up or? Um, I actually, I think that the, I think that the Fed stance for lower for longer or almost forever is a reflection of where we are in the, the super cycle of deflation and the realities of the demographics in the U.S. and the fact that we do have an aging population, the fact that a lot of the service sector that was hit in the pandemic is not going to be uh, re-employed in the same type of jobs. We'll have an increase in automation. A lot of that is going to be disinflationary and it's going to be disruptive to the labor market. And so while we might find ourselves in a situation where the economy, the aggregate economy continues to grow reasonably well, parts of the employment market come back relatively strongly, we won't necessarily have the type of inflation that gets the Fed worried. And as long as we don't have true demand side inflation, the Fed is going to let the unemployment rate drive even lower than it has in the past with a goal of really decreasing the unemployment rates for the sector that lagged in 2010 to 2019, which was the, the lower wage earners. And it's when that subset really started to see upward pressure on wages, and downward pressure on the unemployment rate, that's when we finally got inflation back. It was a very late cycle inflation, but that's what the Fed would like to see. And while I would personally like to see a quicker transition through that process and rates end up being higher sooner rather than later, I think the realities of the the length in which the pandemic uh, residual will extend, I think, leaves the Fed with a bias to be uh, lower for, for longer than we have seen uh, in the past. Just for context, the last financial crisis, uh, or last crisis, the Fed didn't do anything for five plus years. And the, the argument is that this one is um, broader, and it's not just a banking sector issue. So that was, so that I think politically, when you talk about one administration versus next, I think politically that actually bodes well for uh, a Biden president and anyone he might bring in uh, favoring a lower unemployment rate reached by lower interest rates. So I think it might be a framing issue, but it will we'll have certainly a bit more clarity on that over the course of the next several months. And then we did give us enough time to get some more questions. Lily, do you want to? Um, I'll start with a question that we received upon registration. Um, somebody asked what our immediate plans were to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the impact really from what we've seen is in the marketplace and what becomes available to us on a daily basis. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been less of a need for financial institutions to, to be in the market requesting us to purchase their CDs and place deposits with them. Um, so we're more reactionary than, than trying to avoid it. It's, um, 
we're watching credit every day. Tracy and her team are doing a great job keeping track of how um, the commercial paper programs that we invest in are being impacted by this. Um, it, we're, we're, we stay ahead of it. We, we tend to get our own kind of thoughts going um, before the credit agencies actually make a decision to change the credit strength of an institution on their rating side. I mean, you get warnings, they tell you they're on downgrade watch and they explain why, and then we actually make our decisions immediately. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, we're paying attention to it and it does affect what we do. I don't know if I would say that we have any uh, plans ahead of time. We, we're just reading what happens in front of us every day. Exactly, and as, as I said, it's just, it's just a matter of using the information that we're given. We receive daily input from various, as I said, economists, you know, and we get information from on a daily basis, other economists from other banks, and it's just a judgment call based on years of experience. I mean, much of the staff that's in this office has been here, as I said, you know, 20 plus years. So we have a lot of experience going through downturns. Obviously, this one is unique. Um, but a lot of the markers of it aren't, you know, when you see uh, the issues of, you know, credit and liquidity becoming, you know, tight, you, you move in that direction. And that's what we've tried to do is just to move in a direction of more safe, more liquid investments. So. Okay. Our next question comes from Lucy Dong. As a local government, can we participate in LAFE as LAFE only participant, which means we invest all our funds to LAFE? That would be um, your oversight would decide that if you can or not, if it can only be a portion of your investment or if you can, that's not for us. We have a cap and if all of your investment fits under that cap and you want to place it with us, you can. Um, so you'd have to go to your oversight and see what your, uh, your, your local government code states that you can and can't do with your money and then go from there and then go through your board to make that decision. And and just contact our life staff. I, they could give you a walkthrough about what the you know various requirements are and withdrawal issues are and whatnot. Yes. Okay. Marisol Gomez asks, what tips of info would be great to write into investment reports? We have to provide to the council on a quarterly basis. Wow. Uh... And every, every, I think every area has different challenges and different needs. I mean, if you're a cash flow driven portfolio, that's going to be the most important part is to watch when you need money available. Um, you know, from a credit perspective, I don't know, Tracy, do you want to mention anything about, I mean, if you don't have access to like a Moody's Fitch or S&P, it gets kind of tough, but you can find that at, at least the ratings on Bloomberg if you have that. Um, you know, it, it's really going to be what your oversight is going to be needing. Um, the state needs are a little different. We're a lot bigger. Um, we have a, a lot of resources at our, our disposal that some of the locals may not have. And I, I really I have a hard time answering that, not knowing what challenges are in front of you. Sorry. Our next question comes from Robert Dawes. When do you think the PMIA yield will fall below 50 basis points? So <laughs> this is that's a, a really good question that I really wish I didn't have to answer. Um, <laughs> um, the daily yield has uh, approached that number already. To be honest with you, uh, the P the late parts get paid what the quarterly average it is. Um, I was pleasantly surprised surprised at how high that number was on June 30. I thought it'd be a little lower than it was. Um, I. I would say by the end of this year, I would say your December 30 apportionment rate, you know, with the little bonus money still coming in from loans should be above that, but not much longer than that. It's, uh, it, it's a lot of the maturities that we bought. The last time I was thinking about before we did this was that we bought stuff that was over 2% is it's two years ago next month was the last time I bought a 2% security. Um, so all these things are maturing and coming off and everything that we're buying is at the rate that you see in the market today. So the, the yield is coming down faster. Um, I think we can make it through fiscal year end with an average earnings around 50 basis points. Um, it could be less than that by December 30, though, um, in terms of what you're being distributed. But the daily earnings are already there in the portfolio. Our next question from Elizabeth Scratch. Ian mentioned an aging population. How does an aging population impact inflation and or interest rates? 
That's a great question. So generally speaking, as one makes their way through their their working lifespan, they tend to spend more in the beginning, save more as retirement comes on the horizon. So that means think about a typical uh, lifespan. One would purchase a home, start a family, fill the fill the home with uh, goods, uh, utilize more services when their people are raising a family, et cetera, et cetera. The, as that all scales down, not only do we have fewer consumers in the economy, we also have fewer uh, people contributing on the labor force side. So we have a smaller labor force. And as that relates to interest rates, generally speaking, and particularly as I think about the next 20 years, let's call it, there will be a push that was already underway to replace a lot of jobs with automation. And not, I'm not talking about conceptually robots doing daily chores, but rather uh, think about the, the, how quickly consumers were able to adopt a lot of the uh, smartphone technology and things like driving cars or trucks start to come to mind and then robots within the production sector and that type of automation has really started to take on, uh, have a lot more uptake than one might have expected or than we saw even a decade ago. And for that reason, that conceptually is disinflationary because it reduces, it has fixed cost at the beginning, but it reduces costs over time. And that also reduces aggregate wages or aggregate wage pressure. So as a result, you'll see less upward pressure on wages. Uh, it's a, it, it does contribute to unemployment, although it would contribute at a point when people were already taking themselves out of the labor market, just the demographics retiring. Uh, and so I think that it will serve as a more obvious replacement than it will a, a crowding out for workers nearing retirement. So with that context, what does that mean for rates? Uh, generally speaking, when a central bank is faced with either lower than expected inflation or underperforming inflation, they tend to be easier, which manifests itself in either lower policy rates and or increased quantitative easing or other measures to stimulate inflation. So overall, generally, not only in the U.S., but the global aging of the Western population, population is expected to continue to be a downward pressure or provide downward pressure on inflation and subsequently rates over the next couple decades. Okay, and one more from our registration process. How do you think the markets will react to a new president? I'll defer to Ian. Yes, we'll <laughs> defer to Ian. <laughs> um, one of our one of our biggest one of the biggest questions in 2020 was what does a GOP or a Democrat president mean for the market? Because of what has occurred during the pandemic and because of all of the opportunities to gauge investors' response functions to the amount of stimulus, for example, in the system, we are now in a position where whether it's a GOP or a Democrat, it matters less for the market's response. What matters the most at this point is how quickly we have that result. So if we get it within the first two days, the upside in the equity market will continue. That will be net positive for interest rates in the front end, yes, but more uh, more obviously further out the curve because the, the moves can be bigger in this environment. And if we do find ourselves in a situation where the results are contested for an extended period of time, that's going to be negative for investor sentiment overall and really curtail the degree to which we would expect longer dated rates to increase. The other thing that that could contribute to, depending on how negative of an impulse it initially is, would be the Fed being forced back into action. 
all else being equal, the Fed would rather not do anything between now and the end of the year. But if we do see a tightening of, on, in financial conditions as a result of people selling, of investors selling equities or investors selling uh, credit instruments, then that actually in and of itself might be a policy um, prompting event from the Fed. So less, I think at this point, we're less trading the, the party or the individual, and now we're just trading, getting past the event risk itself. Can you take a couple more? We'll, we'll end this at 12.30. Okay, let, let's, uh, there's two more left, right? Three. Three. <laughs> John Adams asks, what is the background or rationale behind the $75 million cap? Why not unlimited? I think the, the simplest answer is when uh, Lake was created, we weren't really in, created to be the only investment for somebody. Um, we wanted to be a part of their investment options and, and help them with their investment ability and, and cash flow needs um, with it kind of being treated by like an interest bearing checking account. Um, and that hasn't really changed in philosophy. We've grown as you know, states grown, the local agencies have grown, we've made that cap a little bit bigger. Um, either of you know how many people are at the cap now uh, of all the accounts that we have? I mean, we have thousands of lake. Wow, stop my head. No, sorry. Yeah, but it's not more than 10, is it? I mean, no. Yeah. No. So uh, it wouldn't benefit very many people, and it would um, put a little bit more strain on everyone's ability to manage the cash because the, the core behind lake is your money is available to you every single day, and if you have a $100 million account, you call us at 9 in the morning. We kind of have to make it available to you, and that'd be really, really tough to put on us, um, or even unlimited if you have a much larger portfolio. So, one, it, the, the biggest reason is we weren't meant to be the only investment that you guys have, and uh, two, we probably have to put more constraints on the transactions if that were the case. If it was an unlimited size for, you know, option, we'd have to find more mechanisms to make sure you don't. Call us at 9:45 and say you need 100 million dollars by 10 o'clock. So, yeah, I would. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I, I just yeah. think that's the biggest part of it. Yeah. And then, so. Okay. Our next one from Jeremiah Lim. About when do you expect the late apportionment rate to get down to 0.25 percent or lower? Okay. So, <laughs> what I did while I because I did see that question. If you go to our website um, on the late page, there is historical rates. Um, so I try to put us in the same position. Now, as the last time the Fed lowered the Fed funds rate to where it is today, um, as so we just were what 1.47 on June 30 was yeah. the apportionment rate. So the last time I saw that during after that was in 2009. Uh, it was 1.51, um, and it took until well we can say the first quarter of June 2013 for it to be 28 basis points on the apportionment rate. This is going to be a little different. Um, Rates are even lower now than they were then and what we're being able to buy in the market. And if you remember the slide that I showed with the Treasury curve, I showed one then. The curve was still steeper then than it was now, and we were buying things in the you know, two- to three-year arena at 20 and almost 30 basis points, which we don't even see now. The, I've been tracking the three-year Treasury note just to see, and it hasn't even gotten close. Last Friday, it got close to 20 basis points for the first time in months, and then it's right back down to 17. Um, so our options in terms of finding things above 25 are so few and far between that I think it's going to be a little faster than that time frame. But I, I mean, that I can just say, just look historically at how the portfolio has performed. It is a bigger portfolio now, which may make it drag a little bit, but it, it, it could be a little bit faster than the last time, just based on what we are replacing the maturing securities with. Okay, and our last question comes from David Zwieg. Why do you not invest in corporate bonds? If you want to help me with this one, or you want me to say <laughs> that if you want to correct me, yeah. Um, it's not that we don't want to. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into that decision. We have the green light to buy them. Nobody has mandated that we don't. Um, the last time, honestly, I, it's been a long time, um, was the financial crisis when that hit. Um, a lot of our corporate bonds were in financial institutions, and it, and it was uh, a tough, queasy stomach time for us. We had 
almost daily meetings with the treasurer to let them know what the market value was of those securities if we chose to sell them, how much we could possibly lose on them, and that kind of got us out of that market for a while. Now the difference being um, a lot of the corporate bonds that we do see presented to us are much longer investments than we're really interested in. Um, even by if our policy, we couldn't buy them anyway. Most of them that we see are in the five, seven, ten year arena, and that's longer than we're authorized to purchase with our investment policy. And a lot of them aren't in the strongest credit names that we're wanting to, to invest in. So it's a tough find. We'd love to buy them and add that yield to the portfolio, believe me. We talk about it all the time. Um, it'd be a lot more uh, work for our credit team, uh, Tracy and, and her team that they work. And they're willing to take it on and, and they're looking. We're, we're trying to add them, so don't be surprised if you see us buy something. Uh, we're looking and we want to. Um, so it's not that we don't want to and it's not that we don't. It's just we haven't found the right fit yet. And um, we tend to be slow to the party, I like to say. We're never the first one at the door, banging on the door to walk through and do something. Um, but we're going to get there. It'll be a part of our portfolio again. I, I can see that happening. Um, a lot could be where we are with the economy today, too, and, and the impact COVID's had on, on what we have available to us. So. But thanks for the That's a great question. I'm glad someone asked that. Thank you. All right. Well, that was our last question. If we can move to the next slide. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And, um, of course, if you have any questions, you can go to our website and email me. My email address is there. It's super simple, C-S-A-R-R-O-N at treasurer.ca.gov. Um, so thank you for attending our 2020 LAFE webinar. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, yeah, thanks, Ian. <laughs>